understand how people were so committed to all these um, idols that are made of, of um, either wood or, or, or stone or, or of other mat material and giving them all this acknowledgement when they couldn't do anything. They can't move, they can't speak, they can't do anything. And he said, the true God who is able to do so much for us is the one that we are not giving anything. And so for the, um, for, for, for the, for the memory verse, he, he's focusing on Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and verse 21. Uh, if we can read that together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all, we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation, forever and ever. Amen. Paul is, um, is, is, is given actually in, in um, Ephesians chapter 3, he's actually given a, a set of prayers for, for, to, to, for, to the, the believers in, um, in, in, in Ephesus especially to the Gentiles, because they were the ones who were, who, who were mistreated and, 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 uh, and um, separated from, from, from the Jews who believed that everything came through them and that they were God's chosen people and salvation was only for them. But Paul wanted to, uh, the, everyone to know that salvation was not only for the Jews, but salvation was for all men, including Gentiles. So as we are studying, the, the, the title of the lesson is The Mystery of the Gospel. So here's my question, and I need your, your response. What, what was so mysterious about this gospel that Paul is talking about? What is the mystery about this gospel? Based on your study, who, who, want, who wants to, to, to be the first one? What, based on your study, what was mysterious about this gospel? The Gentiles should be here as well as the Jews. Okay. What else? What else? The Gentiles have the same, the same opportunity to participate in the gospel as the Jews. What else? Also, that this, this not only makes them um, having access to the gospel, but it also unites the Jews and the Gentiles as one, being one family in, 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 the, in, the, in the church, right? So it also is, is a unification process. This gospel unites people, not just Jews and Gentiles. It unites all people. Because this gospel is for all people. So it's a, un it's a uniform gospel. It unites us together as one. Anything else? Anything else that you dis discovered that this gospel did? Mm -hmm. Yes. In that this gospel is not, it's not a good gospel of man. It is about what Jesus Christ has done for our salvation. It is about the plan of salvation for everybody. The plan of salvation for humanity as a whole. That's what this gospel is all about. And um, it also gives equal promise to the... Um, to, uh, uh, to equal opportunity to the promise of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And it also calls, calls us to receive this ministry of grace. This gospel is, 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 is the grace of God given to all mankind. When we accept it through faith, we receive the grace of God. It's nothing that any of us did that makes us um, qualified to accept this plan of salvation. It is all the grace of God. Yes, sir. Yes, in 
solution to all that. Mm -hmm. The gospel has a support. Mm -hmm. This gospel was put in place. Uh, I mean, this gospel was from the foundation of the earth. Before God created the earth. Before God created us human beings. God saw that we needed the gospel. So, so God just put it in place when man sinned. Mm -hmm. And it is, as has been said before, everybody, all souls, all created beings. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so we see that this gospel is for everybody. He, um, this gospel also, was this gospel something that was popular at that time? Was this the normal thought and trend of people during the time of, during the time of, of this gospel? No. So then, if it was not something that was receptive and something that was popular among people, would it be safe to say then that you are going to have a lot of opposition towards this gospel? So, what were some of the things that Paul himself encountered as a result of the gospel? And the, my second question, what about us today? Are we also encountering some opposition towards the gospel of Jesus Christ? That, those are the, my questions. What were some of the things that Paul himself encountered? And what about us today as members of the church? Are we expected to experience some of these things? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Right. So, 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 so he, he endured some hardship as a result. But one thing I noticed that he was also very committed. He was very committed just as he was when he was Saul persecuting the people. He was very committed towards doing the job that he considered to be his responsibility. So when he became now this individual, he was called to, pro to proclaim this gospel. He, and he, um, he faced a lot of difficulties during that time. And um, I see a sister here wants to share, us, share some words with us. Come on up, Sister Simmons. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's too hot. Happy Sabbath, everyone. You know, I like the fact that Brother Walker talked about Paul was anxious. He was, he was so anxious to get this word out, to tell the people the truth. That gospel, that mystery was not just given to, to Paul, it was, as we're saying, it was given to others. It's given to us also. But the main thing is the unity. When we look at the Holy Spirit, we look at God, the Holy Spirit. We look at God, the Son. We look at God, the Father. What do we see? And it's unified. They do not walk by themselves or work on their own. And that's what Paul was excited about because now he's joined with this power. He's joined with the other disciple, the other apostle, because this, I believe, Brother Walker wasn't given, that mystery wasn't fully revealed to the prophets, right? Mm -hmm. So basically now, Paul is saying, listen, I want to do this because now I am, have been given the authority, the commission, the, 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 what you can call um, just that privilege. And we ought to be like that. Mm -hmm. We ought to understand and embrace the privilege and the, the power and the authority that God has given to us to, to, to serve and to talk about things that people can be educated. And so I just want to remind us, brothers and sisters, if we are working with the Trinity, we need to work with each other to get this gospel out in boldness. And that's what Paul is doing from the prison that he's in. Amen. Amen. So, 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 so what I'm hearing is that there were some hardship that he experienced while bringing the gospel 
of grace to non-believers, um, to the Gentiles. He made himself a willing prisoner. <laughs> he made himself a willing prisoner. In fact, he said that he identified himself as the prisoner of Christ. As the prisoner of Christ. So, as, 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 as one who was called by God to declare this gospel, he was willing to undergo the difficulties. He was willing to undergo the arrest. He was willing to undergo the beatings that was given to him. And not only that, he said he counted all <laughs> joy. He was not upset with them. He said he counted all joy because to him, to be a prisoner of Christ is, more, is better than to be a prisoner of the Roman people. <laughs> you know? So, as a, as a people, as a church, as a people and as a church, is it that we don't want to endure hardship while we are not so committed towards ministry, towards mission, towards bringing this gospel of the kingdom to people who don't know it? Why? Why is it that we are not seeing that same fervor and that same desire to preach the gospel among the people of God? Come on, talk to me. Why? Oh, mercy. So, so it seems like there, there hasn't been much change going on in the lives of people so that they want to share with others what God has been doing to them and what God has called them to do. Mercy. Mercy. That's a church. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So um, I think also that we are people that like to get we need to make it in. Mm. So mm. you know, we are nice with it. Mm -hmm. Have mercy. Okay. So, so yes. Call us in the back. Go ahead. Mm hmm. Uh, okay, so, so, so what this brother is saying that he believes that when we go through persecution, it, it kind of motivates us to want to do more for Christ. But if, how are we going to go through persecution if we, are, if we are quiet? If we keep silent, how do we experience persecution? What will they persecute us for if, if we are quiet? Right? Because we become so comfortable and so quiet, we say nothing, so there's nothing to be persecuted about. And I, I, I think that, Paul, um, that, that the, 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 um, the writer also talks about the condition of being a prisoner in the Roman society. He, he, he was saying that it was not a pleasant one. There was no, there was no, you know, there was no amenities that were prepared prepared for you so that if you need to go to the bathroom or to the restroom you have all those things there it wasn't like that and he will say it was a difficult situation and maybe maybe in today's church 
we are more concerned about social injustice that we don't want to say anything because we don't want people to, um, to come ag out against us. And so we don't say anything. We keep quiet. But that is not what God called us to. As a people of God, we are called to go and proclaim the word. He said, don't even worry about what you need to say. Go ahead. And the Holy Spirit is the one that will give us the word that we need to say. So we need to forget about being being timid about being persecuted because being persecuted for Christ's sake means that there is a greater reward waiting for us. Go ahead in the back. The question is, will it, will it be only those who serve God are those the only person who will be persecuted? Is, is, there, is there an answer to the question? Anybody want to respond? Go ahead, sister. Wait, before we respond to the question, mm -hmm. I'm really asking if you guys can come up here and use the mic because we are online as well. They can't hear you. Mm -hmm. So the answer is in a vacuum. So mm -hmm. we can hear and hear, mm -hmm. but we can't hear you out there. Mm -hmm. And we have a great big audience. Mm -hmm. So we can move all around in here, but we want to be someplace where they can see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, good morning and happy Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Now it's like this. If somebody gives you a whole lot of food and you eat until you're hungry, you don't want any more food. If you are being persecuted, you're doing something that they want to persecute you about. If you're doing nothing, why would they persecute you? Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right, come sister. And then you... Mm -hmm. I thought there was one with the focus. So I agree with, with what the gentleman in the back said regarding persecution, but if we read in the, in the Great Controversy, Chapter 3, it says that um, it is only because the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently popular with the world. Have mercy. Let there be a revival of faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Mm -hmm. So until, until we're actually out there doing something and causing a shift, causing a change, there will be no persecution because we're here and we're compromising with the world. We look just like them. Amen. Amen. And it's a serious thing when the church looks like the world. <laughs> <laughs> In presenting the gospel to the people, no one likes persecution. Uh, no one likes to be arguing. No one likes obstacles. If I'm going to tell someone about Jesus Christ and I see obstacles or I see someone is trying to uh, argue my point or so, sometimes I get discouraged or sometimes I say, look, I don't want to go that way. That way. We, so that is one of the reasons why we, we fail to, to, to promote the gospel. We fail to tell others about the gospel because of uh, fear of opposition or we want things to be smooth. We see here, Paul was fearless. Whether there is persecution or whether there is obstacles or so, he was fearless in, in, uh, in preaching the gospel. And we should be like that. We should fear, we, should, we know we have the truth. We know we want to spread the gospel. Regardless of the obstacles that we may face, we should be fearless as Paul was in preaching the gospel. All right. So, like, like, like what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that if we, if we start proclaiming what God is doing in our lives and, and, and share that with others and let them know what God can do in their lives as well, then we will be stirring up the people towards righteousness. And those who enjoy doing sin will be upset with those who want to do righteousness. And as a result, 
then persecution is going to be, to be um, rekindled among, uh, among the people of God once we start practicing the things that we, that we preach. Right. And this is not just within our church, but within the entire world. A lot of, a lot of us as Christians, we don't practice the things that we preach. There's a lot of compromise going on in the church where we are doing the same thing that the world is doing, and there is no difference between the world and those of the church. As a result, there's no need for persecution, but once the Holy Spirit is spread among God's people, he is going to rekindle within us that fire that we will go out and tell people about this salvation that God has for everyone. And then we will have persecution. And then we will see a difference in the church, uh, uh, in, the, in the people of the church, as we, as we have it now. Go ahead. Also, just like to your point, the fact that the disciples, when they started talking, and they, we studied this a couple of, I think last month, when they started to proclaim the gospel that God is saying, God's intent is that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God mm -mm. should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. God is saying, listen, I'm putting on notice, Satan, mm -hmm. that I have a church mm -hmm. that is going to proclaim. Mm -hmm. And just like those times, forgive me, I'm a very passionate person <laughs> about this. Just like the times when the disciples were being persecuted, the more God embraced and the more God sent the Holy Spirit and the more people were ready to take this gospel on, on brothers and sisters. Until this starts happening, when we ask and pray and get the fire of the Holy Spirit, we will not be afraid because guess what? We know that God is with us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we cannot keep sitting. Mm -hmm. We cannot keep sitting. Mm -hmm. It has to go somehow, collectively and individually. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we are not doing things individually. Mm -hmm. But the collective, mm -hmm. we need to come together, mm -hmm. remove the differences, and go with the fact that God has given us the power. Thank Amen. You. Amen. Amen. So, this gospel here <laughs> is, it, it, it seemed to have been long hidden from the, from the world and from, and from the Gentiles. It seemed like it was only known to uh, just a few people, but this gospel was now brought to light when Jesus Christ came and died. He brought this gospel to life, and not only did he bring this gospel to life, but he also made stewards of the gospel through the church. The church has become the steward of this gospel who is supposed to be the one proclaiming this gospel. Are you members of the church of God? Are you being steward of God's gospel? I asked a question earlier, are there two types of persecution? But I was not satisfied because, with the answer, because um, the Bible says that those who serve God must suffer persecutions. Mm -hmm. we, we were in study this week with the lesson, and there were there other Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists who were on the line, not of this area. And when we brought it to, our, to the attention that only those who serve God will suffer persecution. The person said, no. There's another persecution where, there's another persecution where if you go and cause conflict on yourself with somebody else or going to somebody else's business, whatever, you'll be persecuted. And I tell them, no, the Bible didn't say that. The Bible said, those who serve God must suffer persecution. Should somebody explain that for me, please? <laughs> okay. I, I, I guess what, the, what, 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 what she said, if you're busy body and getting into people's business, that is not being persecuted for God's sake. You know, that is just you just being fast and going into people's business and, and, and saying stuff that you're not supposed to say and doing stuff that you're not supposed to be doing. 
But when we're talking about persecution, when you are doing the work that God has called you to, to do, that is what we're referring to when we talk about persecution. Then the devil is upset when you're doing God's will. And so he will come now and stimulate people around you to create more difficulty and more uh, to, 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 be, to set up barriers against you fulfilling the will and, and purpose for which God has called you. That's that's what we are referring to when we're talking about persecution. Right. So, so, so it's very important that 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 we that that we that we recognize that. Also, Paul talks about the church being the uh, the revealer of God's wisdom. How is the church of God revealing God's wisdom to the world? Talk to me. How is the church of God supposed to reveal God's wisdom to the world? Nobody? Nobody? Last week, we had a pretty powerful sermon here at our church mm -hmm. where um, we heard that in order for dry bones to live, they must hear the yes. word of God. Yes, sir. And uh, the, the way how the church reveals um, God's will to the world is by knowing the word. Mm -hmm. This is something that the Apostle Paul did. He took a whole three years vacation, if you will, and went into the wilderness to understand what Jesus wanted him to know and to present to the world. It is, that, it is in that way that he understood this mystery that the Jews did not understand or the Gentiles did not understand. And as a result of understanding that mystery, he is now able to proclaim vigorously to the entire population, both Jew and Gentile, and anyone else who wants to hear what the Word of God is. So if we know the Word, if we spend time learning the Word, understanding what God wants us to do and what He wants us to say, as uh, Daniel says, it now becomes a part of us. It, it, it sort of ingrains us, and we have the power now to go forward and tell what God has done for us and what God has taught us. That's what happened in the life of Peter, Paul, and all the great apostles. It is what needs to happen in our lives today also. Amen, amen. I, 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 and it's, it's, it's important to know that God has called and he has also given his grace to all those who have responded to his call to become the, 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 um, the, the, the stewards of his word. And when we spend time in learning about God and, and his plan of salvation, then we, when we understand this plan of salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no way we can keep it quiet. We have to say it to somebody. We have to share it with somebody. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the, 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 um, the, the church re reveals more the power of God, number one. The church also is to be revealing the, um, the plan of salvation that God has in store for everyone. Those are, those are some of the things that the church, the church is also supposed to be revealing to the world God's love. The love of God is not something that you can just fully understand and just, eat, eat, uh, just, and just get it easily. The love of God requires him to be in our hearts. When he comes within, when we experience the love of God, that's when we are going to be revealing to others what he has done in my life and what he can do in your life. Come. One of the amazing things that while I was reading the lesson study this week is that Paul said, I am the least or the less of the least. <laughs> Meaning sometimes we can feel as though man you know, I'm so, I'm, I don't have all this. Mm. 
But yet, when you look, when you look, when you look at it, and actually said that in 1 Corinthians 59, but then he, he also said, the very least of all the saints. Finally, he described himself as chief of the worst sinners. So sometimes we get so timid to want to go and say something. But when God is in us and we realize how less we are and humble we are, as you're saying, it gives us somehow, no, because of that, Paul is saying, but nevertheless, I still have that power. Amen. The power of God. Of God. Mm -hmm. And I could still be bold. Mm -hmm. And even if they accept me or not, I'm going to give this message. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm going to give this message. Amen. What I discovered also is that the more time that we spend learning and, and experiencing Christ himself and the word of God, it shows exactly who we are and where we are. When you, when you spend time learning about Christ and you see his mercy and his compassion and his, and his dedication and his faith to God, it, you, you, you look at yourself and you say, I am nowhere close to him. I am so, I am so, I, I have so much to do, you know. But that is, that, is, that is the power of the gospel. It shows you who you are while it shows you who God is and how perfect a God is and where we need to get to. In Steps to Christ, it said, the closer you come to Jesus, the more fault you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Yes. Brother Duke. I have a question here. Is it possible that someone who ha does not know the Lord uh, can reveal the wisdom of God to, by just reading the Bible and pass it on to someone but has not internalized it or accept, accept it themselves? Can they... Can they can they share, can they reveal the wisdom of God to, uh, uh, to others? <laughs> so he wants to know if an individual who does not know God, can that individual reveal the secrets of God, the wisdom of God, by just reading? That's what he wants to know. Can that happen by just reading the word? Anyone want to respond to that? Come, brother. <laughs> Good to see you again, Elder. <laughs> Good morning, church. Well, to the best of my recollection, I can only say yes. The reason why is because the Holy Spirit, he is the great teacher. And once we are willing to learn and to understand, he will always be there with us to lead us through. So this is my answer. I believe, yes, he will. And it has been happening all the time. He has done it to me, and I'd be sure he will, done it, he will do it to others as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me hear say one thing that the Word of God says. To know Christ is to experience Christ. If you don't spend time with Christ or time in the Word of God, you are not going to know him, but there is a difference also between a head knowledge of him and a personal heart knowledge of him, because that's, that, that's a whole different thing. A lot of people, their education alone can let them read and understand, and they can, and they can orate and, and, and tell you all about it, but it does not mean anything if it's not coming from a personal connection, a personal relationship. That's the difference. When you share a personal relationship of what you're having with Christ and about God, then is where the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to you the, 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 um, the, the, the things about God. Because it's not of man's own knowledge. It is of the Holy Spirit. We see earlier on that 
Paul thought he knew it all. He went to the highest school of all the prophets, the Jews also. And they thought they were proclaiming everything that was great. But not until Paul came into contact with Christ himself, mm -hmm. like you're saying. That's when his life, he even got blind. But he had to realize and recognize who Christ was and wasn't about what he knew. Lots of times people can, don't get me wrong, there are people who may read this Bible or read the word of God, but put their own interpretation That's it. Mm -hmm. to what the word is saying. And many of us, I'm not talking about us here, many of us are buying into this because we're not studying. We're not checking for ourselves what the scripture says. We hear and we interpret what they have interpreted. And so we run with it and we become all into just listening, hearing, and seeing. Remember, remember this wisdom of God here is, uh, is, is, is how God is able to take two sets of people who were at odds with each other, the Jews and the Gentiles, right? They were isolated from each other. They, they, they were not considered friendly with each other. But the, the wisdom is how God is able to, through Jesus Christ, unite these two nations together and remove the wall of partition. That's that wisdom that he's talking about. All of that is through the love of God. It's through his love for mankind that he does this. And through Christ, he is able to remove the wall of partition. And instead of these two nations becoming two enemies, they are now considered to be one body, one family, united in Christ. Why? Because Christ is now dwelling inside our heart. If the same Christ is in you, Sister Bailey, is the same Christ in you, Dr. Carrington, is the same Christ in me, when we talk, we should talk in unison. When we act, we should act in unison. But if the Christ in you is different from the Christ in you and the Christ in you, yes, there will be division amongst us. But when Christ dwells within the heart of his people, that's when the church is united as one. And that's the, that's the purpose for which Christ created this church, to unite the nations of the world together as one. The people together as one family. That is why we go around and we say brother and sister because we have the same father who dwells within us. If that same father is within us, then we will talk, we will walk, and we will behave like the father wants us to behave. We will not be about our own way, having our own way and doing our own thing. We will be doing the will of God. That's the unification that Christ dwelling in us will bring about. When Christ is in me, when my brother and my sister have a need, because we are a family, we take care of each other. We try to help meet those needs. We don't go about and try to establish that, oh, I am better than you and I have more than you. No, it's about meeting each other's needs so that we can be one, one people, one family, one blood, the blood of Christ that dwells in us. The church will embrace and unify all people group by each member have been Christ dwelling in us. We treat each person regardless of race as brothers and sisters because we are one family. We treat each person equal regardless of their social status in this world. When Christ dwells within us, when Christ dwells within us, we don't see ourselves better off than anybody. We see ourselves all at one place at the foot of the cross. When Christ is in our heart. Part of, 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 of Paul's last um, prayer statement is that people will glory in the church and in Christ. 
we will not only give praise to ourselves, but we will give praise to Christ and the church for what it is able to do in our lives. For the purpose for which it, it, it was, it was um, established. That's the difference. Whenever we feel and press, the, uh, whenever we feel the press of problems, temptation, or doubt, we may turn to this buoyant account of Paul's prayer. The imprisoned apostle raises our vision to the grand horizon of God's purposes and grace, reminding us that whatever our current circumstances are, we are participants in God's ultimate plan, and his power is at work in us. That is, what this whole, that, that is what's so mysterious about this whole plan of salvation. It is able to change lives. God changed lives from the inside out. And when he changed our lives, we talk, we walk, and we are different. And this mystery is revealed through us. I encourage you, brothers and sisters... Reveal the plan of salvation by having experience in Christ in our lives. If Christ is in us, we cannot be silent. We have to go and tell somebody about what he's doing in my life and what he can do in your life. May God bless you as you continue. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath, church family. Sabbath. It's time for our health nugget this morning. I'm excited because this is the first time I've ever gotten to do this. So I'm excited about it. We're going to be talking about a growth mindset this morning, a growth mindset. I'll wait for the uh, media team to pull it up there on the screen. Growth mindset, prayer and praise is required. Amen? Amen. Amen. What can this mindset help us accomplish? A growth mindset empowers us to embrace a love for learning. It encourages us to explore new subjects, take risks, and see failures as opportunities to iterate and refine. It teaches us to focus on the process rather than the outcome, because it's the journey of improvement that truly matters. Whether it's mastering a new skill, acing an exam, or excelling in extracurricular activities, a growth mindset can propel us forward. Amen? Growth mindsets will lead to resilience. One of the most powerful aspects of a growth mindset is its impact on our resilience. When, our encounter, when we encounter setbacks, instead of giving up, we got to bounce back. Say bounce back. bounce back. We learn from our mistakes, adopt our strategies, and move forward with renewed determination. This resilience is a vital tool in facing the challenges that life inevitably throws our way. It starts with our beliefs and our own self-talk. So when you're faced with a situation that's a setback, instead of saying, I can't do it, go ahead and throw one word in there. Say, I can't do it yet. Go ahead and say that. I can't do it yet. That yet word holds incredible power. It implies that success is only a matter of time and effort. Amen? The next thing, a growth mindset is a philosophy and a way of thinking. This growth mindset is not just a phrase, it's a philosophy, a way of thinking, and a key to unlocking our own potential. It's about believing that our abilities and intelligence can be developed through dedication, hard work, and learning from failures. Now, students, as we get ready to return back to school, you've got to remember to adopt this way of thinking. And it's not just for students, it's for adults, too, as we go through life. So in contrast, a fixed mindset is the belief that our talents and our qualities are static unchangeable traits, and that's not what we want. Next slide. Six things I want you to take away with this. Six things that can assist in building a growth mindset. We're going to say them together. Number one, say it with me. Say self-care. Self Number two, health care. Number three, watch the company you keep care. Ah, number four, learn to say no care. Yeah, we're going to talk about that one. Number five, prayer care. And number six, praise care. Yeah, let's break it down now. Make time for self-care. How many of you make time for self-care? Raise your hand if you make some time for self-care. The fact that I don't see a lot of hands going up, there's the problem. Setting aside time for yourself is extremely important. You cannot truly impact other people and be available until you are filled yourself. Amen? 
Setting aside time for yourself shows that you appreciate and respect God's process in creating you. You can't expect others to be more concerned about your own well-being than you are for yourself. Self-care takes on numerous forms. It could be daily walks, it could be routine workouts, bike hikes, reading, meditation, whatever it is. Be intentional and be consistent. Say that. Intentional, consistent. Nothing can be value added until you make it a consistent habit. Amen? Next one, health care. You know the saying, your health is your, come on, your health is your, the ability to grow mentally and spiritually has a lot to do with the way you take care of your body internally and physically. The older you get, the more you should check in with your doctor to ensure your temple is running optimally. Your health is your wealth, and your teeth are a great example of what can happen without good health care. Do you know what I'm talking about? As adults, we neglect to floss every single day. Amen? Oh, some of you are like, no, no. We floss all the time, two times a day. That's good. But you're the only one raising your hand with the two. Everybody else in here is looking at me like, that's right, one brush once in the morning and once at night. If you decline taking care of those teeth as you get older, what happens? Cavities, root canals, you end up losing them, bad gums, gingivitis, right? And so you are already in a place where you need to fix it. So instead, make sure you're regularly checking in on your health. So that's self-care, that's health care. The watch the company you keep care is next. This part is simple and doesn't require many more words. Surround yourself with individuals who have goals, dreams, and aspirations to be better than they were yesterday. When you are around other great minds, you become great by association. I can't tell you how much Steve and I suck at golf until we're around good golfers. Like, in the beginning, we're not good, right? We get paired with somebody else that's good, and all of a sudden it unlocks something new in you that's that competitive side, right? So when you surround yourself with individuals that are trying to get to the next level, you will get to the next level by association, by default. But if you surround yourself with individuals that are trying to pull you back, do I have a witness, somebody? People that complain, people that are constantly spitting negative energy your way. You're only surrounding yourself with negative things, and that's not going to get you to where you need to go. So make Make sure you watch the company that you keep. The next one, learn to say no care. To preserve your body and your mind, sometimes you need to establish a threshold or a line in the sand when you need to say no. Humans will always ask, regardless of the circumstances or things going on in your life. That's commonplace. You must decide whether or not you accept every request. Remember, the more you accept and take on, the more mental exhaustion you place on your own mind and body. Nobody cares more about you than you. That's a saying that you should remind yourself when you feel bad about saying no to somebody. When you make yourself available, I have a situation, a story with the Miami Rescue Mission. The director of the rescue mission, he had surgery. He was supposed to be out for two weeks. That man came back in three days. I said, Tony, what are you doing? Why are you back so early? He said, well, you know what? They kept calling me. I said, you've got to learn to say no. If you're not at 100%, how are you supposed to give back to all the men in this homeless shelter the way you need to? Learn to say no. The next one, prayer care. Do I have a witness? Amen. Prayer care. Everybody say prayer care. prayer care. Start your day with prayer. Period. Everyone and everything else can wait. They did not wake you up and sustain your life. Prayer tells God you value him, his direction and his guidance more than your own thought process. A strong prayer life leads to spiritual eyes, wisdom, and discernment that will help you navigate life better. Prayer care allows you to trust God more. Ladies and gentlemen, start your day with prayer, please. End your day with prayer, please. You can't do anything. You don't know what the next hour holds. When you start your day with prayer, you're giving God the keys to your life, to your vehicle, to drive that car where he sees fit. Amen? Finally, praise care. When God comes through for you, both in small and large things, acknowledge him and where your blessings came from. Don't pray for it. 
receive God's blessings, and then walk away with a quiet praise claiming I got lucky. Your blessing is not only for you, it's for those around you to be encouraged as well. Anytime someone says, hey, does anybody have a testimony? The church should be clamoring to get up and speak. This is where the saints of God encourage one another through the power of their testimony. No sermon, no small group can be better than someone who's going through something, hearing somebody else say, I know where you've been, and I can tell you that with God, all things are possible. Amen? In conclusion, a growth mindset is not just a skill to be developed. It's a mindset that can shape our destinies. It's about embracing challenges, learning from failures, and continuously striving for improvement. Students, it's about believing in ourselves and in our capacity to achieve great things through effort and perseverance. As we continue on our journey of education and personal growth, let's remember the power of a growth mindset. Let's approach every challenge with enthusiasm, every setback with resilience, and every opportunity with the belief that we can learn, adapt, and excel. Let's cultivate a mindset that not only empowers us, but also inspires those around us to reach for greatness. And remember, in order to grow, prayer and praise is required. Amen. Bow your heads for prayer with me. Father God, thank you again for this Sabbath. Thank you again for the summer that was, and as the students and teachers and adults, and we all get ready to get back to school, Lord, we pray for our students. We pray, Lord, that you give them a successful school year. We pray, Lord, that all the distractions that may be coming their way from social media, all the different bullying avenues, Lord, that people choose to take from cyber to in person, Lord, you eliminate and you remove those things, Lord. Help them to remember to start their day with you, with prayer, to start it, to end it, and to be confident that any setback and any failure they can overcome if they continue to trust in you and continue to build that growth mindset. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do we have a hallelujah?